From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. Take a quick browse through history and pop culture, and you'll see we've always been rather fond of witch hunts. You are all hereby found guilty of the crime of witchcraft. I sentence you hags to be burned at the stake until you are deemed fit to re-enter society. Brothers and sisters, there is still a witch among us. Let us throw open the floor to uh, wild accusations. A few centuries ago, women were burnt at the stake. Now they get digitally lynched on social media for expressing an unpopular opinion or just taking up space. Not the same. In many parts of the world, online violence is a license to quickly escalate into real-life violence. And as a lot of us know and have experienced, violence can be verbal. And emotional and psychological wounds can take a lot longer to heal. Multiple surveys have shown that there's been an alarming surge in online violence along with actual violence against women and girls during COVID-19. We've all seen a lot of ugliness during these polarizing and pandemic times, and a lot of it has been directed at women, particularly women of color. We are often told to have a thicker skin to accept that that is the price to pay for being an equal participant in the public sphere, but a lot of us don't see it that way. It's not part of the job, and it's not okay. Today, Shri Paratkar, the star's race and gender columnist, joins me to explain how gender violence may have shifted shape throughout history, but there is a sinister purpose behind it that remains unchanged. Hi, Shri. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Sabha. Nice to be here. So, Shri, I want to start with a bit of historical context here. How do you think our perception of violence towards women has changed over time, over centuries? And when we look at things on ground, has anything changed at all? Yeah, that's a good, long and broad question. Because if you look at the history of patriarchy, it always begins with the premise that men are the leaders of the household and women are property. So even if we chart the progress of women's rights over the centuries to, say, the Renaissance era in Europe, because if you're looking at it from a European perspective, then you get into this idea of complementarity. You know, in theory, that sounds good, right? Like it sounds like men and women are complementing each other. And then there's a bit of balance. But that's not really how complementarity worked. It was more about how women can behave and what they are allowed to do in relation to men. And so therefore, if men take up the job of working outside the house, then women can only be in the private sphere. If men can be leaders, then women can't be leaders. And so in that context, a man gets to be aggressive, but by definition then, to complement it, a woman has to be demure. So in this kind of a scenario, forget aggressiveness for women, there's no space even to be assertive because that would then hack away at that idea of manliness. My own theory is this is also why there is so little tolerance for gender fluidity or for a non-binary understanding of genders today because from a patriarchal point of view, Another gender must only exist to serve men, to please men, to be available for when they want you on their terms. So in very simple terms, patriarchy is a pretty fucked up deal. And I don't see any reason why we should subscribe to it. Right. It's all about the framework, as you're talking about. But we're seeing some things changing or shifting in some ways, maybe as women are reclaiming their stories and people say what is a revolutionary global Me Too movement is taking shape. But has that had any effect on the culture of toxic masculinity that you've been alluding to? You're right. So I don't want to say that Me Too has had no impact. I think certainly there's been a big change made. It's been okay. It's been made okay for women to come forward and talk about sexual harassment in a sense that there is a higher chance today than there was, say, two or three years ago that such concerns would be taken seriously. There is more of a sting attached to the reputation of men if they are implicated in such a scenario. But then you could also argue that this is a glacial pace of change. 
that at best it may have emboldened women to come forward but there's not necessarily the same consequences for men to fundamentally change so if you look at the rcmp the royal canadian mounted police they saw a historic sexual assault settlement with more than 2000 women and then there was a report titled broken dreams broken lives by a former supreme court of canada judge who said that the rcmp has a toxic culture which has proven intractable his words and he says that the rcmp encourages or at least tolerates misogynistic racist and homophobic attitudes and then damningly he said that rcmp employees appear to blame the quote unquote bad apples without recognizing the systemic and internal origins of this conduct so the rcmp's commissioner who's a woman brenda lucky she expressed outrage she expressed sorrow at these findings and she said yes there is absolutely no room for sexual assault and harassment and discrimination and racism she also said she herself has been subject to harassment and yet the one thing that the broken dreams report asked for which is an external review was something that she didn't adopt so i don't know if we are ready to understand systemic change if we are ready to understand systemic oppressions or whether we are still very much at the surface language level of all of us learning and you know reflecting and trying to do better but i don't know if we are actually at the level of accepting change and how would you say the many forms of misogyny and and violence against women have changed shape in contemporary times from what we've been discussing all of the reports that we've been seeing the foundation and attitude sort of remain the same right it's about the need for women to have their spaces shrunk to take up as little space as possible right absolutely it's about having to fight for every single attempt to take up our rightful space as i said in my last column that you know women may be enfranchised we may have won the right to vote but we are still not taken seriously on the political stage right even on that stage we are still judged for our bodies we may see representation in senior corporate echelons but we are still fighting to close the gender pay gap we may be carrying out jobs that are deemed essential but we are still undervalued for them which means we face the worst effects of the pandemic right and we face abuse in the course of our domestic lives we face abuse in the course of our professional lives as the rcmp example shows and so we also face setbacks in the very human task of birthing babies right not just physical setbacks but again professional setbacks too and so we may be sexually liberated to a point but we still have to fight for our autonomy over our own bodies you know whether we want to have sex whom we want to have sex with how often we want to have sex with whether we want to be fully clothed whether we want to be in a niqab or whether we want to be in a bikini all of it comes with a judgment right and so you know even what we want to do with our own uteruses so to my mind yes we have progressed but the fact that we still have to fight so hard for it is extremely disheartening because we are now in 2020 and some of these issues should have been settled a long time ago we'll be right back written about this often i want to know in countries like canada how important is it to acknowledge what part systemic racism also plays into misogyny and gender violence and why are we often quick to reject that assertion here it's something i've noticed i think not acknowledging systemic racism in gender violence is a form of violence in itself because doing that that rejection suggests that only white women are worthy of being liberated discrimination due to race and discrimination due to gender are not mutually exclusive they intersect 
if I can't see that the kind of discrimination that black women face is vastly different from what someone like you or I would face, then I would erase what they go through. And I would not have the ability to consult with them to find solutions either. In so many ways, if you take gender and race, then it's a double whammy. You take gender and race and add a new immigration status to it, there's a triple whammy. You take gender, race, immigration status, and say you're trans, it's a quadruple whammy. And so these burdens don't just add up in a linear way, they compound. And now we have other platforms or other ways of displaying the same sort of semantics and nuances of violence. We have digital violence to contend with now. And recently, it's been very triggering for me to see some of our female colleagues, as you know, who've been getting viciously attacked online for doing their jobs. I just wanted to know, because I read your recent piece, is that in part what led you to write your recent article about how so little might have changed in society's attitudes towards women over time, even though the mediums may have shifted or the language. So at what point is it going to be okay for women to express our opinions without being dismissed as either hysterical or somehow not taken seriously as if our brains are not strong enough or that we are not rational enough to come to solid conclusions just because the conclusions we come to go against the grain of what benefits men and white men. Yes. And like you mentioned, it's also not just our female colleagues in newsrooms. We've seen the same kind of online vitriol targeted towards female politicians, women in other fields as well. And you know, when I talk about this stuff, I often get this, which seems to me a bit of an excuse that everyone gets trolled online, etc. But the online hate is what I've seen very different in context when it's targeting women. And I want to talk about the headline for your recent piece as well, which mentions that the cuss words might have shifted from which to bitch, but it's all the same purpose. It's sort of part of a process of demonizing women in particular, right? It absolutely is. The point that I was making in my column when I made that comparison about which to bitch was that A few centuries ago, women would be burned to death, blamed for sorcery. You know, you could blame women if the weather was bad. You could blame women if the crops were not plentiful. You could blame women if you were economically not doing well. And then it was just easier to call them a witch and then burn them to death. Today, it's easier to call a woman a bitch just for having an opinion and then to hang them in digital public squares. Right? Like, so this kind of punishment, which is digital now, can range from derogatory statements about a woman's appearance. It can be abusive language. It can be threats of physical and sexual violence. It can be also doxing, you know, releasing sensitive and private information about women. It can be revenge porn. It can be something even more sinister in the sense of blurring the lines of online harassment and real life harassment, where it can lead to stalking and unfortunately even murder as we've seen around the world. I know that I come from this particular context where this is triggering for me in the way where I come from a country where online violence is often an invitation or a signal towards real life violence. And that's sometimes what ends up happening. And I'm sure you've had your own experiences with this kind of vitriol. What are the dangers of this kind of trolling? Why is this particularly harmful for women. It's not just harmless, you know, making comments or saying something. This has more subversive motives, right? Absolutely. You know, we go back a little bit to what I said in the beginning about who gets to be in the public domain and who gets to be in the private sphere. The way I like to compare it is when I lived in Bangalore in India, I grew up where there was one inescapable constancy on the roads was to be what was called as Eve teasing. You know, the insolent stares, lewd comments, fingers that would pinch breasts and swinging arms that hit your butt, right? And then I come to Toronto and yeah, I enjoy walking the streets, but then I get on my phone and it's kind of like being back on the streets of Bangalore, except that it can be even worse because then a phone allows these people to intrude your safe spaces as well. And so it's the same scum, often more literate, 
but this time they're hiding behind a screen. So they're even more toxic and even more hateful. So in terms of, you know, what you said about being asked to toughen up or to ignore it, right? I grew up being told to toughen up and to ignore it. And I found the same advice here as well, that, you know, it's on them. It's not on you. You take the moral high ground. You take the high stand. And I think that's a very unfair burden on people who are the recipients of violence to take. And I do think that such advice reveals not only the advisor's inability to recognize abuse and not only the rejection of your experience of violation, but it also insists on inaction because it says, if you keep quiet, you will be at peace. But in fact, it enables the abuser to heap that degradation elsewhere. So I absolutely reject such advice. It's very interesting that you should say that. It sort of seems like women are being asked or could be asked to be giving up more space instead of taking up more space. And that's been my experience in working in Pakistan as well. It was sort of a form of rebellion and protest to continue to fight back and to be able to take up space while being trolled or attacked. And here I often hear the advice to just ignore it, which is a little triggering. So it seems to me a form of self-censorship or a way to maybe silence a woman a bit more. So I'm really glad you said that. Okay, so this is a broad question, Sri, but I want to ask you how this is this unchanged attitude of misogyny and gendered violence harmful for our society, not just for women, but every one of us. And where do we start? What do we do to try and transform this culture? Mm -hmm. That's the big million dollar question, isn't it? The running theme, I think, of our discussion today has been about space, right? You just, you know, women being told to take even less space. And if we look at space in the continuum of the operation of patriarchy, then we cannot, by any stretch, even consider taking up less space. That is the opposite of what we have to do. But... To do that, it cannot fall on any single person, any single institution. There has to be a network of support that allows us to do that. It also means relying on men who have historically also been feminists to step up and be there for support. And so while I wish there was a BuzzFeed style listicle to smash the patriarchy, <laughs> and, and it's very, very hard work, I would say, there are simple things that we could do. They sound simple, but they are not easy, right? So it would be for us in the media, it would be don't amplify patriarchal viewpoints. Position women as experts as well as men. Promote women into leadership qualities, you know, have more role models. Promote women who don't necessarily adhere to a point of view that benefits men, which is equally important promote different gender binaries, stop objectifying women's bodies, stop objectifying transgender women's bodies, stop looking at men as leaders and women as nurturers in families. And I think even if we did a little bit of all of that, we might be on our way forward. Right. And, and for men in particular, you know, when they say they're allies or there is a need to step up, uh, stepping up or being an ally doesn't mean being a silent spectator and not participating in the violence. Right. I just want to clarify that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It does mean having to get uncomfortable. It's not enough for a man to not be violent. That's a really low bar. It's not enough for a man to simply be non-abusive in his personal relationships, you know, it, it is important that a man not be a bystander in gender violence. He doesn't have to be an eyewitness to it, but it does mean that he has stepping up also means stepping back to make space for women. It also means amplifying women's voices. It also means not taking women's ideas and passing it off as their own. So there's a lot of very active things that men need to do beyond just existing as silent spectators. That was a very interesting discussion, Sri. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you for having me, Saba. I know we could have gone on and on. Oh, but yes. Thank you for this. Over coffee, perhaps. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> that was Sri Paratkar, the star's race and gender columnist. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Saba Itazaz. 
Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is JP Fozo. Our show theme music is by SoCal, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.